Penitent Ones, it's time for your daily dose of boss ranking. Our masochistic metalhead is back with a vengeance in a sequel jam-packed with a quality roster of bosses. If you're unfamiliar with the game, think Hollow Knight, but instead of bugs, it's devout Roman Catholics. Let us waste no time and prostrate ourselves at the altar of boss worship. Number 11, Incarnate Devotion. Well, don't kneel too soon. Incarnate Devotion's name may well imply we should be in awe, but the emotion I would describe this finale fight with is boredom. A wall boss, it sits there clutching bloody pearls while environmental hazards do the work. Vertical beams sweep inward and out, requiring an iframe dash. Explosions come out by the half dozen towards you, demanding a double jump. Repeat these riveting attacks for 90% of the battle, and you can see why I'm falling asleep. It does light the floor ablaze and ask you to dodge amidst puny platforms, but it's hardly a tall order after a far more precarious playthrough. Once per Fireface, he'll spawn a quartet of flowers that shoot slow-moving, destructible orbs. You have to destroy all four in a short time span to end this mini-phase. If you're too slow, they respawn, but the timing is very lenient. The final trick up this devotee's sleeve is Dagger Rain. Evading is as simple as standing between the vertical line of fire, though this can be tricky with a light touch on the joystick over D-pad or mouse and keyboard. I wouldn't say this boss's design is bad, it's the definition of mid, both in challenge and quality. While that bodes well for the list as a whole, I'd rather have a bad boss try something interesting than end the game on a mundane, lukewarm fart that stinks up the final moments. Number 10, Odin and the Confraternity of Salt. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. This arms race to keep up with the modern player base of masochists has led to an open admission they want you to get salty. And boy did this seafaring shitbird burn sodium into my very soul. Odin has a wide move pool. He has a quick thrust forward, a charge into a dashing slash, a backslash with a water blast, a leap off screen into slamming whirlwind and dual side blasts, a spear shockwave, and he can summon two adds. As the fight progresses, he'll summon two additional adds, make them invincible periodically, and add additional spears and water blasts to previously advantageous attacks for you. While I'm grateful for a diverse kit, the speed at which he's able to string so many different abilities together is unpredictable, leading to harshly obscured offensive consistency. It's primarily how quickly he can recover into the forward thrust or backward blast. Both of them demand a rapid response, one you can't reliably deliver if you assumed an animation would lock him long enough for safety. You have to really study the length of each recovery frame, which can be frustrating with ads drawing your attention away. They aren't a potent offensive threat, instead acting as living, moving arena hazards. Odin already has plenty of attacks to command space within the arena, making their presence a detriment. I would assume the uncharacteristic length of the arena is meant to mitigate this, but it does little to alleviate the nuisance. Do overtuned recovery frames and annoying ads ruin the experience entirely? Not quite. I still think the overall design is commendable in spite of glaring weaknesses. Unfortunately, for me personally, this above average affair was soured by a sound glitch. Guess what I heard upon entering Odin's Thunderdome? That's right, nothing, aside from a downpour and my own sounds. For some reason, the boss was muted. No soundtrack or sound effects. As someone who relies heavily on sound for battle cues, this was agony. I thought it was an odd stylistic choice until I finally decided to reset the game in case and realized, oh, it was just broken. Even if Odin has some promising features, his downsides drag him too far beneath a sea of incoming quality. Number nine, Sona Formosa Fembra. I just want to say pronunciation is hard, don't at me. Back to the ranking. In contrast to Odin's impressively wide kit, you can count floating pauldrons moves on one hand. She spams trios of lightning orbs in an arced pattern while flying around, she sweeps the arena with a huge beam, and she sits on the side of the arena and fires vertical bolts and orbs. What makes her more engaging than devotion is that she moves. You're under far more pressure when you're chasing your target as she litters the arena with dynamic hazards. Those lightning orbs can be quite tricky to evade due to tight threading and her erratic movement closing off safe paths. I actually preferred how she sped up as the battle went on. Quick movement spreads the orbs out a lot more, making it easier to evade. The huge beam only changes in the number of charges back and forth and the size of the overhead safe spot. While I didn't notice any difference in the sweeping bolts and lightning orbs fired from the side. Like Odin, she's a reasonably strong design that has drawbacks. Hers primarily being overly simple design in the final hours of the game that pales in comparison to deeper peers. Number 8, Sonoto, Hymn of the Thousand Voices. At risk of being pedantic, 
the Man of a Thousand Faces may as well be wearing Sonas, because they have an eerily similar structure. The hitbox is a moving, high target. The moves focus on creating hazards within the arena to prevent you getting close to said objective. This includes sweeping flamethrowers, miasmic centipedes and shockwaves, a flame pillar with ground shockwaves, and a neat heal mechanic you can stun it out of. The one that rings closest to our previous entry is the spinning shock orb array, one that compounds later with staggered multi-waves to evade. The final portion is the most exciting with an acrobatic arena change, but the boss died too fast after for it to be anything more than a cool concept. Sonoto gets more credit for a wider move pool, more interesting animations, and coming directly before Sona, making her feel more tired by comparison. It's a bird! No, it's a plane! It's... Faceless One! Chisel of Oblivion! Why does that name go so hard? You dropped this, King. For all my groaning about simplistic, shallow move pools, you're probably wondering why a boss with two very simple moves deserves higher honors. It's all about placement and game pacing. Sonoto, Sona, and Devotion all take place in the game's final hours. Meanwhile, Faceless Gigachad soars into battle minutes into your playthrough. It works as a brilliant tutorial to hammer in your two methods of evasion. Jump over the rollout, dash out of the wheel toss. The game cleverly introduces you to movement controls via a short platforming section just before for this, only long enough to make you comfortable with the controls, then throws you right into the action. A fantastic introduction to the game, the Chisel of Oblivion carves high marks on my list. Number 6, Great Preceptor Radamax. This oversized skelly has range to fear, with swipes that can turn into overhead slams with the glint of an eye. He'll mix in magic shots to duck and hop over, then charge into the wall, which you can take advantage of and backflip to booty smack and central. What's really spooky scary about this skeleton is his gamer posture. The amount of times I got behind him only for him to scrunch up and back that ass up for a cheap shot was maddening. In reality, it's my fault for not respecting the large spaces Scoliosis needs, but it felt annoying amidst a battle already full of hit and run. At least it feels that way. The reach on his filler attacks feel designed to force you backward, especially in the second phase when he eats some jerky for a heal and stands up. His attacks are all similar, but with new glass-based animations, plus varied range and timings. For example, he can telegraph as if he'll shoot magic, then instead fire three glass shockwaves. It's a great amount to keep in mind and react to quickly in between the short windows you get for offense. He's quite tanky, which preys on low healing reserves of the early game. It's a well-balanced challenge overall that is quite compelling to overcome, even if I would argue his range and recovery outside of the glass charge are a little too skewed in his favor. Number 5, Benedicta of the Endless Orison. A platforming battle that is largely decided by how adept you are at attacking and evading while constantly on the move, Benedicta spends the majority of the battle doing laps around her two platforms. The walls are Pac-Man-style teleporters, raising that skill ceiling quite a lot. The only thing keeping her steady are her attacks, asking you to evade and attack at the same time. That is, with the exception of the circular orbs. These are destructible, leaving her wide open to combos if she's near a platform when spawning them. Her lightning attacks are nothing special, but chained quickly enough to prevent mindless greed. My favorite attack to juggle were the spike pillars she shoots horizontally and vertically. These make multiple rounds before disappearing, asking you to keep stock of many moving pieces at once. Your true foe, though, is the pit. If you aren't keeping tally of your double jump and air dash, you'll quickly miscalculate your momentum and fall victim to the void. The juggling act here plays well off all the platforming experience you gain in traversing the world. It makes for an intense battle where the sky's the limit. Number 4, Orospina, the Embroiderer. Blasphemous's answer to Hornet, this seamstress weaves a silk song amidst a symphony of drum beats. The boom of the bass gives an energetic rhythm to the fight that matches her slicing swagger. She'll rear her sword back in a few variants. If it has an electric charge, prepare for an arena-wide thrust to leap over. If she steps back with charge, she'll swing her sword upward, forcing a dodge. Or she can backstep without charging up, indicating a simple thrust forward. It's a subtle nuance that is demanding to observe, especially when she regularly disappears with a random flash appearing, telegraphing an incoming flurry, or her leap up into lightning projectiles. Both of these attacks grow more fierce as the drum beats do, multiplying to three, then five, then seven. By the time the whole arena is full to the brim, the chaotic energy of battle shot my adrenaline into overdrive, and I began to frantically absorb blows until my greedy trades won me a photo finish victory. It's a thrilling battle that goes to show how far the final few are upping the ante. Number three, Lesme and Infanta. 
I love a good gank boss when the balance hits just right. They take the unique approach of fighting you individually, then entering the fray together at the end. This allows you to be introduced at a comfortable pace to each of their attacks. By the time you make it to the third phase against the duo, you should know exactly what to expect. Though there are some subtle variations and heightened mobility and aggression, you can pinpoint a strategy based on your knowledge. Lesme primarily attacks via tracking slams creating fire pillars, while Infanta attempts to stay at range by charging or leaping away. Yet you know that Lesme leaves himself vulnerable for a moment after his fall, a fact you can take mighty advantage of now that he strings together far more at a time. As for Infanta, while his spike attacks are more numerous, his weakness is his glass constitution. Focus him at the beginning and you'll quickly be back to a 1v1. It's a perfectly paced fight with expert design. Clear tells, the perfect amount of move diversity, and balance aggression make this one of my favorite duos in recent memory. Number 2, Ali 4, Sentinel of the Emery. I absolutely adore the visual design here. The crisp animations and cheeky sound cues make it feel like Haunted Cuphead. There's a whimsy to the way Alifor moves with a splash of color against a grim stage. He spins to win as a top, allowing a dash and counter. He throws ricochet blades with a quick telegraph beforehand, allowing generous heal time or prayer spam. He sharpens the blade before a huge swing, and he leaps, creating a shockwave. Every move has a reasonable way to respond, quickly shattering his blade. He transitions by leaping into the background until he finds a better model. During his search, he showers the arena in unwanted swords, asking you to frantically run to avoid becoming Shishkaba. Or, you know, wait till a few drop, then stand in their place since each area is only struck once, but frantic shenanigans add to the drama. Chaos that escalates with his newly upgraded Silver Blade. Spin to win now bobbles back and forth a half dozen times, but if it lands, he stops immediately, a generous recovery. He'll now jump and toss blades directly at you, and his sharpened swing fires a sword beam to iframe. He repeats this once more with the gold blade, increasing the tension exponentially in line with his astronomical quality to the very end. But there's no boss who puts more pressure on the player and does it with devilish style than our number one boss, Eviterno, first of the penitents. His first phase embodies the phrase, calm before the storm. He offers a handful of extremely well telegraphed moves with generous downtime in between. The key to his offense is the glint in his stave. If it flashes as he disappears, he'll follow with three volleys of two red orbs. If it flashes as he appears, prepare for an incoming blast of four to six orbs at once. And if he glints in the corner, get ready for three waves of vertical shocks. His last attack is a gigantic fireball that blows a high shockwave outward. All of these attacks have clear ways to be dealt with consistently, making it very rewarding to execute. To top it all off, his health barely outlasts sleeping Infanta, making the phase short-lived. All this in mind, it's easy to get through without sustaining damage, given a little practice. You'll be needing it thanks to the aforementioned storm that is approaching. If his first phase vies for the easiest boss in the game, his second takes the gold medal for high difficulty and sprints past the competition. He is extremely fast, with minuscule downtime between most attacks. Finding the right moment to get offense in took a lot of trial and error, especially as I took quick losses, getting used to a pace far beyond what any other enemy in the game prepared me for. At first it felt frustrating, but once I set my pride aside and accepted I needed to learn how to read each move and respond accordingly before I could even consider attacking, the battle became like a zen, ultra instinct moment of dodging, jumping, using spacing, racking up deliberate hits, and unleashing supercharged prayer beams to whittle his health down. I found it best to attack either after dashing through his sword shockwaves at the end of his combo, or wait for the leaping shockwave slash, and dodge behind for a solid counter. Later when he combos into aerial hits, it ends in the same slam for a similar punish, and his aerial 360 spin has a decent window if you can restrain long enough to avoid the hit. His final gambit of rallying most of the bosses into a sequence of attacks that is ultimately not that hard to dodge once you know what's coming, is a fan y moment in all the right ways. From start to finish, this battle forced me to get good in every positive sense of the words, and I have his brilliant design to thank for it. And I also have many of you to thank. It completely slipped my mind that Blasphemous 2 came out alongside Armored Core, so I appreciate those of you who recommended it to me in the comments. I loved every second of it, and I can't recommend it enough. Let me know if there's any other bosses that deserve a ranking, and leave a like to give penance to the algorithm. Thanks for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.